Thank you all for coming here today, and thank you, Mati, for inviting me here. You actually took a chance because this is my first talk at an international conference. And it happens on a very special weekend to me because I get to celebrate my birthday with you guys. I'll be 33 tomorrow. <laughs> Um, I was born in a small town in central Romania on July 8, 1985. The name of the town is Regin. It's in Transylvania, close to the mountains. It actually has some strong German heritage. And in that year, in 1985, the world was very different. The Berlin Wall was still in place here in Berlin, in Germany and it separated the East from the West. As a child from the Communist part of Europe, um, I only got chocolate for celebration. My favorite one was that in red there. It has a, a bit of sour taste. And we only got oranges during Christmas. What you're seeing this is people standing in queue to buy bread. And they often went there to stand in line at 5 or 6 a.m. in the morning. They weren't waiting for the latest iPhone. This is something different there. Um, and I have here a little joke from that time. An old man stops in the middle of the street, looking at his empty bag, confused. I can't remember, he says. Was I going to the market? or was I coming from the market? And the, 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 the orange thing there, that's the label of a very low quality orange juice that we used to have back then, and which was revived a couple of years ago. The apartments in which people lived in Romania, and I think this is true for uh, most countries in Eastern Europe, were cold and dark. Often we had no electricity and um, we had to live on food ratios. We only had a kilogram of chicken every month per person. Um, and we had to limit the way and find uh, ways of finding food. So people who were seen as smart were the ones that were able to get food. It's totally different. How it, was, how, how it is right now. But in this culture of people trying to find food or trying to um, find clothes for um, their children, there were also some computer enthusiasts. This is not a Romanian computer. This is a British computer that was fairly small. Um, it was built around the Zilog Z80 um, A CPU and it used BASIC. How many of you um, know the BASIC computer language? Awesome. <laughs> Perfect. And well, technology in the Eastern Bloc often cloned technology from Western Europe. And people in Romania cloned um, the spectrum. It, it ha also happened in Ukraine, in Bulgaria, or I don't know, in, in every country in Russia, they also cloned. And there are some stories with spies going to Western Europe and the US to um, technology factories, taking some components, bringing them to the country, and talking to um, engineers who were able to reverse engineer them and build a product that was um, bulkier. Because let me show you something. Uh, this is a Romanian computer, but the ZX Spectrum, the, the original um, computer that was um, used to, to make this, is half. It's way smaller. So, anyway, there are some stories of Romanian spies going to Texas Instruments in the U.S. and um, bringing technology. And because we were a bit poor back then, we had to have clones that were less expensive than the original. So we basically try to find creative solutions um, in order to um, be able to have a computer industry back then. 
This is me with uh, my computers at home. So the ones with red, blue, and yellow are cheap computers. This is the name. The blue one is here. The red one there um, is the one that I donated to Computer History Museum in the US. And there's also a blue one upstairs, um, which is fitted inside a telephone case. Because they, at the factory, they used to have telephone cases, and they said, well, why not? <laughs> There's also a computer in Ukraine that's fitted inside an organ case. So the idea was to have a product that um, works. And this is a very rare computer that, sadly, it's not in my collection. The name is Cobra. And it has nothing to do with the reptile. Cobra came, comes from Computere Brasov. Brasov is a city in central Romania, fairly close to my uh, hometown. Um, and the funny thing about this computer, why this computer is special, is that it, it featured not only BASIC, but also um, CPM. This computer was produced in Brasov to be used in factories. Um, and there weren't a lot of Cobras made back then. I, I would say that there, are, there were made less than a thousand. And they were quite pricey. Um, the cost of a Cobra computer was half of the cost of a Romanian car at the time. Uh, we had Dacia Omietre Sute car, which is uh, similar to Renault 12, only I would say a bit lower. Um, and for a regular person working, having a daily job in Romania, it was virtually impossible to um, buy such a computer because, first of all, it was only um, used in factories. It wasn't available on the market, and second, because of the price. So what do you do when you actually want to have a computer but you cannot buy a computer? You build one yourself. And now, when um, I was a little girl in my hometown in Romania, in Bucharest, the largest uh, city in the country, uh, at Politechnica University, the red tiled building there on the hill, there were some people, students, who were trying to uh, build computers from nothing. And when I heard about this story, I said, well, this is actually a good story if it's true. So um, I went to um, a former colleague of mine from the radio station and asked him, well, Mihai, you have the right age. You were in Politecnica back then in the mid 80s. Do you know anything about students building computers? There were probably two or three of them doing that. Do you happen to know them? And Mihai told me, well, I used to build computers there in Politecnica. And there weren't two or three, there were two or three dozen students building. So I said, well, we need to have lunch. He works uh, fairly close to where I work. So I met him and he told me a couple of things about his Cobra. He built it when he was in high school and he said that he's somewhere in his apartment on a cardboard box. Uh, but he's now moving, so I should wait a little bit until he and his girlfriend manage to um, set the house and then talk to him. And I asked him, of course, is your Cobra working? And he said, well, I don't know. I haven't switched it on in a decade or maybe two. Uh, this is how his Cobra looks. It has nothing to do with the original when you compare the pictures because this is not a Cobra case. You wouldn't find cases for Cobra. So each student used whatever they could. So uh, what's funny is that the Cobra worked with a tape recorder and cassette tapes were used as storage medium for computers back then. There was no SSD back then. This is how the Cobra looks inside. Um, the upper part is where the keyboard is. And you have here the motherboard. The, the ugly thing there uh, on the left is the video card, but it's not a proper video card. It was 
built by the students, and there were no two video cards the same. And there on the right is the Z80 chip. And I do have the specs of a Cobra. So you're going to um, find some really cool numbers there. Um, it was three times heavier than the Spectrum. Uh, it, has, it had 16 colors, so pretty good. Okay, so as a student, you want to build a Cobra, but how do you do it? Easy. You have a pack of canned cigarettes. <laughs> and canned cigarettes were used um, as a bartending medium. They were more powerful than money back then in Romania. And also coffee, but canned cigarettes were just Western goods, and they could help you go a long way. This is a, a story from the Wall Street Journal from 1984. So um, back then in Polytechnica University, in the dorm rooms, there weren't drug dealers. There were electronics dealers, people coming to the campus with bags of LEDs and resistors and selling them to the student. Um, and sometimes, you would buy a, ba a bag of electronics, but you wouldn't know how many of them actually work. Um, the case was the least interesting part of the computer. There were some computers fitted inside wooden boxes or metal boxes. And the funny thing is that the motherboards were discarded by factories. What does discarded mean? Some of them were sold by employees on the black market. And they were labeled as, I don't know, faulty motherboards. They had just a small, tiny issue that a skilled engineer could fix. And one of the dealers uh, was called the American. I tried to uh, find him, but I couldn't. Mihai told me that he knew at that time that it was an illegal operation that the police could come. But he said that no student, um, no student had problems with the police because the policeman would say that maybe at, so, at some point I need this guy to build a computer for me, so I think I shouldn't um, arrest him. And what mattered to them was that although um, they did something illegal, uh, they really liked to build something. They really liked to have a very um, cool project and see that they are able to do something that in a way defies the system. And I really liked what uh, Mihai told me. The fact that you could play the game you wanted when you wanted gave you the illusion of choosing for yourself. Choice was regulated by the state back then in Romania. And uh, people had to um, do whatever the state told them to do. We only had two hours of TV program each day. And if you were caught listening to Radio Free Europe, well, bad news for you. So Mihai managed to um, set up his new home, and I asked him about the cardboard box. Do you still have it? Uh, could we maybe try to see if your Cobra still works or not? And well, he said, I still have my, um, my computer. Let's try to uh, plug it in and see what happens. But wait, he had no charger. And he also thought that he needed an old TV set. He said he will have no problem fixing the computer as long as he finds the charger. Well, I did have a charger because you know that I have um, some old computers, but I couldn't just hand my charger to Mihai because as a journalist, you want your characters to struggle. <laughs> <laughs> so I said to Mihai, well, is there anyone you could call? And he said, well, there's this guy. I haven't talked to him in six or seven or eight years. I could ask him, and um, maybe he could help. 
This is a photo. Uh, these are not my guys, but this is how uh, the dorm room of Polytechnica University used to look back then. Uh, this is where they built Cobras. And the guy that Mihai called is Marius Iliwaya. Um, I met with Iliwaya in the campus close to the dorm rooms. He um, had orange juice. And we started talking about the Cobras. And he says, well, I actually built a Cobra that I sold to Mihai's father. And Mihai, Mihai's father only paid me half the money. And he said, well, I'll bring the Cobra home. I'll plug it in. And if it works, I'm going to give you the other half of the money. And this is what they did. And when Mihai, as a child, got the Cobra, well, he played with it a little bit. And afterwards, he decided to look under the hood. And um, he said, well, I think I could do it. And he started building Cobras. He built four Cobras, one for himself, one for uh, his girlfriend at the time, and two Cobras for uh, two of his friends. Um, but unlike Mihai, Iriwaya maintained a small business of uh, building Cobras. He had deals with the dealers, and uh, he was able to buy all the needed parts for 6,000 lei, which is about two and a half a monthly um, income pay. Okay, but he sold the Cobras at a higher price, still lower than the official price of the factory in Brasov. And those were some of the best years in his life. What did you do with the money? Well, party. Okay, I didn't save anything. Okay, smart. And what, what was amazing about these guys was they, that they kept comparing themselves with um, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak and the Americans. And Diliwaya told me, um, what we did is a scaled-down Romanian version of the history of Jobs and Wozniak. They built their first computer in a garage. And if you compare them to um, Apple people, you'll see that Iliwaya is some sort of Johnny Ive. Because whenever he talked about the Cobra that he made, he said, flawless product, perfect line. Others did uh, build computers in three days, but we wanted to have a flawless product. We took weeks to uh, build a computer, two or three weeks, and nobody complained. They were charmed. Uh, Romanian computers, I shouldn't be saying this, but here I am. Romanian computers are known by their faulty keyboards. There are very few computers with good keyboards made in the 80s in Romania. And um, Iliwaya didn't want to buy regular keys, so he bought keys from mainframe computers. How did he buy them? Well, he, t he tells me, this is a story the recorder shouldn't hear. <laughs> okay. And he brought uh, those keys. Um, he polished them with a nail file. He cut the access material. And um, a, a key look like, looks like this today, right? But back then, they were just normal plastic keys. They're, they didn't have letters typed on them. So uh, on the key, people put a small piece of paper writing the letter, and then a transparent cap was inserted to hold that piece of paper. Mihai didn't bother. He just glued the paper, and that was it. And because of the Cobras, um, a lot of um, people started doing uh, connected uh, things. There was a guy who was selling photo papers with letters for every key to uh, the Cobra people. But Eliwaya didn't want to work all day because he wanted to party. He had money to party. So he taught his girlfriend to um, build computers. Um, and he had some creative thing of saving money um, because he, every part that could be manufactured was manufactured. And he was really uh, proud of the power supply unit, which he made by folding um, an aluminum sheet cut in a T-shape. 
This is the video card that I was showing you earlier. Um, it was made out of 20 or 30 general purpose circuit. And it's interesting to, to talk to these people um, about how they felt uh, back then. Liwaya also knows that he was doing something illegal, but actually you couldn't have a legitimate business back then in Romania. And this is a quote that I particularly liked. Even in a communist society, there are entrepreneurs, people who want to risk to make more money than the regular salary. And of course, Iliwaya sips his orange juice and tells me, Steve Jobs would have been proud of us. <laughs> Iliwaya gave Mihai a charger for his laptop, but the Cobra still didn't want to start. So it was time to call that guy who could fix the unfixable. He's some sort of doctor house for cobras, and his name is Mihai Bodic. He was also having a small uh, business back then. He made five or six cobras a month, but Iliwaya says, Johnny Ive, that they didn't look as good as his. But people know Bodic for the fact that he could, um, he could find um, what went wrong with the cobra. And this is how he do it. He connected a TV set <laughs> to a circuit and counted the number of lines that appeared on the screen. If there were horizontal lines, he would multiply that number by 16. And for vertical lines, he would multiply the number by 50. This is how he learned the frequency of a circuit. But Ditch says that um, he encountered many short circuits on motherboards. And he says that this, this was the pretext to uh, classify them as faulty and take them out from the factory and sold them on the black market. Um, at that time in Romania, the regime didn't want people to build radios or other devices, so electronics were highly overpriced. He says that, comparing himself with Apple, he says that he didn't do much. The fact that a dude from a remote place designed a thing with 30 integrated circuits to replace a small $10 chip wouldn't amaze Apple. They were cultivating acres of land while we were caring for a seed in a tom pot. I've asked him whether what he did back then was okay or not, because what they did was illegal. And he says that you wouldn't be able to judge what happened then with today's moral values. Because during communism, people who were able to get more food and more money uh, were seen as smart people. And doing some illegal things was part of the surviving mechanism. So eventually, Badic tells uh, Mihai that he should check every single part of the Cobra. So Mihai gets to work. And I keep telling him he's a Linux guy. He's um, very involved in the open source community in Romania. He did the first uh, Linux distribution in Romania, which was based on Red Hat. And I tell him, well, you're actually quite skilled when it comes to fixing computers. And he said, well, um, there's, back then people were more connected and pe people who uh, knew how to write code, they also knew how to fix their computer. Hardware and software weren't um, different things back then. And compared to my Cobra, developers today drive Ferraris, he said, but when their Ferraris stop, they call the customer service. I can still grab my screwdriver, open the bonnet, and fix it myself. So 
So the Cobra kids did uh, know both hardware and software. Many of them disassembled the Cobra code uh, line by line. Mihai says that he knew what every line does, every subroutine, and that he changed the code to optimize it. I knew whether any bit should be one or zero depending on what was happening. So Moldovanu looks under the hood of his trabant and he shows me capacitors with bolt caps and right electrolyte on top. He replaces them. And magic. <laughs> his cobra started. Horizontal blue and yellow lines appeared on the screen. This is a game, Manic Miner, not Miner for uh, cryptocurrency, Manic Miner. We didn't have a blockchain and we didn't huddle back then. Uh, I do have the game if you're interested. Um, after the Q&A session, we could try Manic Miner. But Mihai's favorite game was Highway Encounter. And after he uh, loaded the game, I just couldn't talk to him. <laughs> he was captivated, and I said, well, I'm just going to um, leave you there. Thank you so much for um, accepting to talk to me and for uh, sharing this story. But while the Cobra kids were busy building their computers in the latest part of the 80s, which was the most difficult part for uh, people living under communism, something started to happen. In Berlin, uh, people said that the world shouldn't be there, that people should be united. And that, um, and little by little, communism collapsed in uh, all the countries in Eastern Europe. At some point, uh, in Romania, people gathered um, in the largest cities. It was December 1989. Romanian president at the, that time, Nicolae Ceausescu, addressed the crowds and he told them, we will give you a hundred lei. Kids, go home. But they couldn't. A thousand people died in Romania during the 1989 revolution. It was a touching moment for me two days ago to visit the Berlin Wall and hear the names of the people who died there to, uh, who wanted to escape to freedom. Ceausescu was uh, eventually tried uh, and he was shot on Christmas Day that year. But there were also um, demonstrations during that time and On, on, on that um, photo, you can read liberty, freedom, there, and don't shot the people, because uh, the army shot the people back then. More than a thousand people died. And in Berlin, at that time, there was even um, a protest of solidarity for um, the, Romanian, the Romanians who died in December. Now, back then, I was a small girl in a small town in central Romania. I was four and a half year. The communism collapsed. And this is a, a relevant photo of me because um, I had my best blouse back then. It's, you won't be able to see it, but it was pink. And I was told to stay still for this photo because it was an unofficial photo. My parents applied for a passport. And many people in Romania after 1989 applied for passports because freedom meant that they could finally travel abroad. Very few of them used those passports. My parents didn't. After communism collapsed um, in 1989, uh, a lot of things happened. Well, the economy um, imploded. A lot of factories were closed down, and inflation reached a maximum of uh, 256% a year, which meant that the price of bread, for instance, would 
grow two or three times during a single day. And back in Polytechnica University of Bucharest, um, there were some students who uh, also wanted to go on with their lives and to do their best, even though this wasn't a perfect moment for their youth. On that red tile building there on the ground floor, there's a door looking like this. It says Computer Network Labs, ED011. And this is one of the most mysterious rooms in Romania. Because each night when the professors were at home in their sleepers, the cool kids headed to this computer lab with a heavy wooden door ready to rock and roll. In this computer lab, kids gathered to target NASA, the Pentagon, military bases, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, and other companies, many of them from the uh, US. When I told my friend Igor, who's also a hacker, uh, that I'm going to have this presentation in Berlin and um, this is going to be my first presentation, he said to me, well, in the Eastern European spirit, um, if you want them to listen to you, you bribe them. <laughs> so I took inspiration from this photo. Um, and I'm just going to uh, offer you some Romanian plum brandy during the Q&A session there for those of you who know the, the right answer for a question. So in order to get to ED011 Computer Lab, you would have to during the night, you would have to bribe the doorkeeper with vodka. At, at that time in Romania, uh, the Scandic vodka was quite popular. It was inside the Tetra Pak, not a normal bottle, like the milk bottles. And um, because it, it was quite squarish and it had a straw, when you attach the straw, it just looked like a Motorola smartphone, uh, telephone, sorry. So this is why this particular vodka was called Motorola Vodka. <laughs> the kids who went to EDO Double One were rebels. They were trying to discover the world, um, just like my parents did with the pa password. They wanted to see, well, what's, how do people look in the US? What do they do? Are they smarter than us? And Many of the kids back then um, grew long hair and wear blue jeans and dark t-shirts, just like uh, people's from, uh, people from the Western world. Um, the whole um, rebel culture uh, was the thing to do back then in the early 90s if you were a student. This is the computer lab today, EDO double one. And uh, back then, the computers were lined along the wall, and the center of the room was empty. So um, a sysadmin standing in the center of the room would see what every student's, uh, student did on his computer. Uh, they had 286 and 386 IBM PCs. Um, the students from the first year only had one such PC, the students from the second year had two, um, and so on. There were about a, do about a dozen um, IBM PCs. And there were also six DAC VT terminals with black and green screen, which were less crowded. Um, the university had some internet connection and it was one of the few places, this computer lab, where uh, students could access the internet without paying. And this is why um, it was so important to them. And let me introduce you to uh, one of the best hackers Romania ever had. His name is Larry. But because I cannot show you a picture of Larry, I'm just using a picture of Larry David. Larry was a thin uh, student, long-haired. Uh, he had black shirts and blue jeans. And he was uh, the student that 
used to upset the dean. It is said that back then, the dean's desk would pile up with faxes from abroad saying that one of his students hacked servers again. And the student, the dean always blamed Larry. He knew it was this metalhead who spent all his nights in the ED-011 computer lab. Um, he used to listen to Slayer. Anyone here listens to Slayer? Oh, great, thank you. <laughs> yeah, they have uh, some strong lyrics, anti-religion uh, lyrics. They often um, are um, quite aggressive in their songs and rebel, and this is why uh, Larry liked them. Like all great things on planet Earth, Larry started hacking because of a girl. He met her online. He was at uh, a university in Illinois. Um, and they were talking on a chat room. And at some point, Larry lost the connection. I didn't know whether she was still waiting for me or not. And in that frenzy, I hacked her university server to see if she was still active. Larry didn't want to disappoint the girl. The server had a standard vulnerability, easy. But um, Larry was in a hurry because he had to catch a train to go to uh, his parents. Uh, and after the winter break, when he returned uh, to the university, there was a huge scandal and the dean was furious. He learned that Larry hacked the University of Illinois. And Larry said, well, uh, at that, that time, I didn't have the time to delete the logs, but next time I will learn something from what happened and delete the logs no matter what. Just let the train go. And Larry thought that he had to be a better hacker. And he started small uh, by targeting Romanian universities late in the night when nobody was watching. And after he hacked all the universities and he got a few complaints to the dean, um, he wanted to start a bigger project. He wanted to see how hackable the whole internet is. He hacked organization that sounded cool, such as NASA or the US Department of Defense's army.mil. And this was his mission, if I, some ordinary Joe from God knows where, could hack the US Army, NASA, and other such targets, imagine what could espionage agencies do. They rely on thousands of experts, and it's just a matter of time until they seize the opportunity. So he wanted to, he doesn't see himself as a hacker, but rather as a gnarly version of Pentester. He was his mission in 1993 to see how hackable the world is. But he couldn't do everything by himself. So he said, let's automate. Uh, he built his tools from scratch. Um, and he developed a worm. Uh, his worm relied on um, database of vulnerabilities, both known vulnerabilities and vulnerabilities that he was able to discover. And when his worm um, was installed on a server, it didn't do harm, he says. It only spread to other servers, reaching new departments within the organization or independent contractors. Larry's worm was a bit better written than the Maurice worm, the great worm, um, who was also made a few years earlier to gauge the size of the internet. And one day, uh, Larry tells me that his worm was able to reach private contractors in the US Army, such as Boeing, Lockheed Martin, and various research labs. He was even able to find some marine radar's blueprints, but he says he didn't do anything with the files he found. What was I supposed to do, sell them? He said, well, no. Um, one day, uh, he tried to hack CERN. He was really passionate about supercomputers 
and CERN had great supercomputers, so it was heaven. But he was frustrated that he couldn't hack their main web server. Uh, paragraphs were separated by a line of made out of plus characters, and he only wanted to add a plus character at the end of that line. He didn't want to do anything intrusive. He just wanted to, to prove to himself that he was able to hack. Well, he actually did manage to hack this uh, server, and he added a plus at the end of the line, but a sysadmin at CERN um, noticed this and um, did some investigations and found out that it was put by someone from Polytechnica University of Bucharest. At which point, the dean got another fax from abroad saying that one of his students hacked servers again. CERN also said that it's great that Polytechnica has people interested in security and that the university should have a safe environment for testing different attack scenarios. This is what Larry tells me. He says that whenever he found vulnerabilities, he would talk to the sysadmins and let them know that there's a way they could fix it. And he befriended a guy from UCLA. Uh, they were in contact for uh, more than a year. And it's really important to say at this point that Romania didn't have legislation banning computer, science, uh, computer uh, hacking back in the early 90s. At some point, legend has it that even Romania's president at that time, Ion Iliescu, called the Polytechnica University to ask the dean, dude, what are your guys doing? And also the US embassy, it is said that um, they also called the Polytechnica University to um, inf enforce some regulation to stop the kids attacking um, foreign entities. I've tried to reach out to the US embassy in Romania and they said to me, well, um, it was a long time ago. We can neither confirm nor deny what happened. <laughs> I've also tried to um, reach out to a former Romanian president, Ion Iliescu, to try to confirm this. Um, I've also tried to call uh, former lady Nina, but um, because Ion Iliescu is tried for crimes against um, humanity, he wouldn't reply. Whenever students did something wrong, they had a professor that backed them. He would close the lab for the night just to show that he's taking measures. Um, but he told me that the, the students only wanted to learn and they didn't want to do um, anything um, bad. And th this is a, a fabulous quote, one of the best that I've received as a journalist. If you don't break things, you won't understand how they are made. So this is why he allowed them to uh, hack. Larry uh, worked very hard during those years, and he said that he lived like a zombie. During winter, I wouldn't see the sun for several weeks in a row. And now we're going to talk about his greatest hack the Pentagon hack. One day, his worm uh, showed him that it was able to access a server at the Pentagon. So Larry tried manually to access that server, and he was kicked out after two or three minutes. And then for a week, he uh, tried to uh, find that server going through different military bases, and he was able finally to find it. And he told me, this is where I got my trophy, so to speak. I found a file with thousands of Pentagon employees with names, surnames, and phone numbers. I've tried to reach out uh, to the Pentagon to see if this information is correct or not. And their <laughs> spokesperson told me, well, this was almost 30 years ago. Um, I couldn't find anyone here who was there at that time, so I can neither confirm nor deny. Larry says that he was the only person um, in the early 90s who ventured abroad, but after the 1996, when he was kicked out from the lab because the, the dean said, well, enough is enough, and he banned him from using the university's computer, but there were 
other hackers who said, mm, this is actually cool. This is actually something we could do. Uh, this February, on a very cold morning, um, I met Ender in Bucharest, in the outskirts of Bucharest. Um, in college, he took the nickname Ender after Orson Scott Card's character, the shy but um, smart kid who trained to um, save the world. And there was also a hacker interested in rock music. He liked to listen to Nirvana, and he liked how Kurt um, Cobain uh, played the guitar. If you listen to Nirvana, how many people do listen to Nirvana here? <laughs> you, um, the notes are, are stacked together, and it shows that uh, Cobain was quite creative, and that the fact that he was a self-taught musician like uh, the character, my Ender uh, became the master of cyber war games. He built his first virus when he was a sophomore. He told me that well, every kid back then in Romania had a computer virus, duh. Um, and he tried to make it stealthier and more compact. He tested it using TBAV and FROT. Uh, he's really happy about his virus because um, he, was, he, he couldn't be uh, caught by uh, antivirus software back then. Ender's virus was quite creative. It booted the computer after four minutes and 25 seconds because his birthday was on April 25th. And uh, at some point, Ender became uh, a sysadmin at university. And because he's a shy, non-conflictual guy, he um, used it against the... Uh, kids who were playing games and not leaving the shy kids at the computer uh, to do their homework. So it was his way of helping the other shy kids at the university. This is a, a better known virus, is the tequila virus from 1991. Uh, and back then viruses did cool things like displaying a Mandelbrot fractal. They also played uh, songs and were, were quite creative. They didn't do um, harm. Well, some did, but they also did some cool things. Um, Ender says that he has never released his virus in the wild and that he only wanted to uh, learn more about computer science because EDO11 was the perfect environment to um, understand how technology works. The best people are those who spend nights learning like we did, not those who get ethical hacking certifications. These mostly teach theoretical principle. There isn't a lot of practical information there, says Ander. I've also met uh, Vampi. Stefanica Vulku is another hacker from EDO11, but unlike um, the other two, he likes to listen to ACDC and Mozart, quite a complex personality, I, I would say. Um, he told me that he once spent 36 hours in a row in the lab, but he wouldn't like to brag about it because there were um, students who would spend two or three days in the lab glued to their computers. Vampi told me a lot about EDO11 being their connection to Western Europe and the US because it was very expensive to travel back then. And he also says that, unlike today, hackers back then had common sense, and this stopped them from causing damage to the systems they gained control over. They realized that nobody's gaining anything from that. And he also says that hackers were, idio double one, hackers were smarter than their professors at university. So it was weird to have that professor come and say, thanks for teaching me things, but maybe you should stop hacking. This is a photo taken um, by one of Vampi's friends, Vampi shaking hands with Linus Torvalds, who went to Romania in 1995. And this photo, I, I was told, was taken after 13 beers. <laughs> uh, we were all dreamers. Some of the dreams are still alive today, Vampi tells me. One 
evening before Christmas, I get to meet Mikutsu, little guy. Um, after uh, the the end and vampy generation came the Mikutsu generation. Um, they had a telnet based uh, chat system called Meet in EDO double one, and they came there to uh, log in and meet girls. And I get to uh, spend an evening having beers with uh, the meat guy, little guy, Phil, Terion, Dave, and Zombie. And Phil tells me during this, being social and meeting people was an important part of the late 90s. And that some of the couples are still um, together today. I've tried to hook up with one of two girls on meat, Phil tells me, but I couldn't. I was too shy. I also talked to Terian and to Zombie, and I find out that they were introduced to ED-011 um, by two girls, one of which was in a relationship with a sysadmin. And what these guys did was basically play uh, games and meet girls and only uh, did pranks to obsess, upset the sysadmin, which is this guy. They still hate him today. The sysadmin uh, has an office in the basement of Polytechnica University. He's still a sysadmin uh, today. Um, and students used to um, make fun of him. They cursed him because whenever a student did something wrong, he had to step in and uh, ban the student from the lab. On his office door, he had two sheets of paper with the schedule and the basic instructions for those who wanted to use the lab, and half of the second piece was empty. So students who hated Pushkashu uh, filled that space with unorthodox words. Uh, and then he printed another uh, piece of paper and he said, in this empty half, you can express your frustrations. So nobody ever dared to um, write unorthodox words, or so he says. Um, a year ago, in a land far, far away, in St. Martin, um, I get to go to a security conference where I see a picture of Polytechnica University of Bucharest on screen. This is the Security Analyst Summit, is Kaspersky Labs um, conference, yearly conference. And this guy here is Kostin Rayu. Um, he's one of uh, the, the best um, experts in, um, from the security industry in the world. And he also spent some time in ED-011 computer lab. His passion is to study uh, the history of malware and to try to find connections between the past and the present. This is why he calls himself malware paleontologist. And at this conference, um, they showed information, new information on the moonlight maze. This is one of the first uh, major threat actors. And they found the server um, in the UK the year before. And using information from that server, they were able to connect the Moonlight Maze, which was the first major threat actor, to the Turla group. This is a Russian-speaking actor that was um, active up until two or three years ago. Um, and they targeted NASA, the Pentagon, and other uh, military um, targets from back then. So they were basically able to connect the two entities. And during the conference, uh, Kostin says something like this, EDO double one was the home of some of the most best hackers in the world. I've watched all these people in amazing. He analyzed um, attack vectors for uh, this research thanks to what he learned when he was a student uh, back then. And people from ED-011 were um, hacking into army.mil, and they had root shells on NASA computers. Kostin would wake up early in the morning at 5.30 to do, go to this computer lab and uh, read what was on the International Liberation Front 
to see if uh, there are new malware samples. He made the RAV antivirus, which was um, acquired by Microsoft. And he says uh, this really cool thing, 99% of all the high profile hacks were just enthusiasts in the early 90s. Kids challenging each other to see who can access the most data. And only 1% of all the high profile hacks were government sponsored. Today, he says, it's the opposite. 99% of all the high-profile hacks are government-sponsored. This is Kostin and his team. And you can see here Vampy, Little Guy, and Ender in the uh, EDO double one computer lab a year ago. Soon after uh, Little Guy graduated, EDO double one lost its purpose in the early 2000s. Romania got warp speed internet connection and also addressed the computer hacking issue. Larry's happy that he was uh, a student back then uh, because um, he, had, he had freedom. And he says that nobody will be able to duplicate what happened there. EDO double one hackers still rule the world. They are among the best um, sys admins and security professionals in Romania. Larry is brilliant. Um, he also does do it yourself projects all the time. Ender has traveled the world, has worked for uh, different companies. Vampy says he won't be Vampy anymore because he's um, wearing braces to um, strengthen his teeth, so by autumn he won't be vampy anymore. Stefan Pushkash is still a sysadmin at Polytechnica University. And by a twist of fate, little guy ended up teaching computer networks in the very ED double one. The Cobra engineers are reconnected after a decade. Uh, they also work for startups and companies in Bucharest and like to mentor the younger generation, telling them that hardware and software should be connected. And some of the engineers who designed the Cobra computers in the official factory in Brasov moved to the US and uh, started working for Apple. Some of them were part of the team that created the iPhone X. So if you happen to use um, an iPhone X, now you know that it's somehow connected to uh, this Romanian computer from the 80s. Most of my stories, they look like stories about hackers or computer professionals, but actually they are not. They are stories about regular people like you and me, sometimes people who don't have a lot of resources, but people who have passion and want to discover the world and want to do the best with what they have. Um, I would like to remind you that we have this uh, Romanian brandy. Um, I hope you paid attention to the presentation and we're going to have a Q&A session upstairs and one of you could win this. And after the Q&A session, maybe we could play some manic minor on an old um, Romanian computer. Thank you so much for being here today.